I've heard that a lot, um, at least in the like the tarantula and scorpion hobby. Uh, people that have been keeping, um, you know, especially tarantulas, like that's the bioactive enclosures, like the new uh, hot thing at the moment. <laughs> it seems like even species that don't really need or would benefit from a bioactive enclosure, people are like, oh, they look cool. I want to put this arid species in a bioactive enclosure or something. Um, but that's like, a, I, don't, I don't know if it's an old wives' tale or a new wives' tale. I don't know if that's a thing, but... <laughs> It's like the the new thing that's kind of sweeping across uh, the invert hobby is that isopods are dangerous for tarantulas because, especially with the tarantulas molting, that the the isopods will just start feeding on it. But and then that, like you said, it's kind of controversial because as many people that have said I have had this happen to me, there's as many if not more people that say, well, I I keep isopods in the enclosure and it's I've never had a problem. Right. So has, has there been any instances that you know of where? an isopod would attack a living animal or do they only go after dead animals? Well, I have heard a couple of things. Um, I've heard that beetle pupae, for example, if you were breeding beetles and you try to keep isopods with beetle pupae, they will eat them. That's um, from a respected um, invertebrate author, Oren McMonagall said that straight out, uh, that that has happened. But in his experience, his extensive experience, I think that's the only one he's ever mentioned. I have never had a problem with isopods eating any of my pets, you know, in a bioactive setup, but I have mm -hmm. also not tried everything. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, um, I have, for example, kept um, Porcelio labus, um, dairy cow isopods in with a crested gecko. And some people say, oh, don't do that. I've, I've been doing it for a long time. The, he, they do the greatest job at keeping that vivarium clean. The, the gecko's fine, haven't had any problems at all with that. And, uh, it, it seems great, but that doesn't mean I can say, well, I've done it, so it works, because maybe someone else has a different experience. So what are the benefits of keeping isopods in a, in a bioactive enclosure like that? There are quite a few. One is that, and I think this is maybe the one that most people find most attractive initially, and it's it's very helpful component. They will eat poop. They, they will just eat it. So if you have uh, lizards, frogs, whatever it is, or invertebrate frass uh, that they're producing, they will eat it. And getting rid of that and not having to clean it up as much is nice. Now, that doesn't mean you'll never have to clean it up because, for example, I keep crested geckos and they don't care where they poop and they will poop on the glass sometimes and the, the isopods can't reach it. So you have to wipe it off. Um, sometimes it'll land on a piece of decor in a place where it's too dry or just too inaccessible for the isopods and they won't get to it. So you still have to spot clean. And then um, reptiles will produce urates as well, like the white part of the poop, and you have to clean that up because isopods generally won't eat that. But that's that's yeah. a big one. I mean, it, they take care of it fast enough in a nice, healthy, mature bioactive enclosure that you don't have to worry about smelling it or seeing it in most cases, except in the exceptions that I noted. Or if they go in their water dish or you know, something like that, obviously you want to yeah. clean that up. But that's one. And they will also take care of sheds. And that's uh, in reference to invertebrates as well as reptiles. If, if your lizard or your, um, you know, a lot of liz lizards will eat their sheds, but they'll miss pieces. The isopods will clean it up. With snakes, snakes just leave their entire skin there, of course, and the isopods will eat that. Within hours often, they'll take care of most of it. I mean, they're fast. Um, yeah. Inverts, like my tailless whip scorpions, uh, I can leave the, the molt in there and not have to worry about it getting all moldy because isopods will eat it. So there's that. Um, they will also eat dead plant material. So if you've got uh, plant leaves that are falling down and dying, the, the ice pods will eat that. But another really important aspect is that, of course, nature abhors a vacuum. So if you have a beautifully planted enclosure with substrates and you don't have ice pods and springtails in it, you're going to get something living there to take yeah. their place. And it's going to be fungus gnats or forid flies or mites or, you know, all three things like that. But if you preemptively put the ice pods and springtails in there, they're going to greatly reduce the amount of those other things that come in there. And once they reach a nice, healthy, mature population, they're basically going to crowd them out, outcompete all those other more pestiferous uh, arthropods that we don't want in there. Yeah. Now, can you do just isopods or just springtails or do they work better in, as like a combination? I think they work best in a combination, uh, partly because one of the reasons we want to control the organic material in there is to control uh, fungal growth, especially mold. Right. And, uh, springtails are kind of a, a specialist on eating mold itself. 
whereas isopods will more eat the things that the mold would grow on and not give it a chance. So by using both, you're sort of covering your bases. There are also places that isopods can't reach as effectively that springtails can. And uh, springtails are great, but they're also really small, and so they just can't handle the, the sheer volume that isopods can. So yeah. they're they're beneficial. Uh, it's beneficial to keep both. And I, in fact, keep springtails with most of my isopods, and I think a lot of isopod keepers do, uh, just for that reason, because springtails make a good cleanup crew for the isopods, and the isopods and the springtails make a good cleanup crew for everything else. Okay. Now, this is um, something I've been wondering for a while. Like, I've only been doing bioactives for, I think I started my first one maybe about a year or so ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I've got like a, a ball python in a bioactive enclosure, um, a milk snake, some tarantulas, uh, uh, one of my scorpion communals is bioactive. And the issue that I, I've, especially when it comes to like the tarantulas more than anything, when it, you don't have to change the substrate out and clean it out as often, but occasionally you do, especially like with the geckos. Like, I, I mean, they make a mess sometimes. And how do you um, save the isopods or springtails that are in that current communal? I mean, do you just throw it all out or is there some way of transferring some of the healthy parts of that bioactive into a new bioactive? Yeah. Yeah. And it totally depends on the kind of substrate you're using because with, uh, you know, like a fully tropical or subtropical bioactive setup with, uh, with a drainage layer, uh, which you'll use with dart frogs and with quite a number of other species where you're trying to make sure that there's this layer of, um, you know, porous material like um, hydroton or whatever that uh, make, make sure that the humidity of the enclosure and the, that is uh, kind of constant to some degree and that there's also uh, water available for the plant roots. If it, that's the kind of bioactive setup you're going to, replacing that substrate is both more expensive and a little bit more involved than it is if you just have, say, something like cocoa fiber and some leaf litter and an inch or so of that. And, you know, that's they're both totally different situations, really. But if you're going the, the full multi-layer substrate by active route, then I would recommend taking some of that substrate and just sprinkling on top of the layers of your new substrate when you replace it because you're going to have some of those isopods and springtails in there. Uh, and then that will help. If you have the other type of substrate where it's just like cocoa fiber or something similar to that and you're keeping isopods in there, then you can throw some food in there for a couple of days and then scoop up whatever isopods, you know, congregate around the food and springtails and whatnot, and then do the same thing, just reseed it and, and add some of that original substrate back in because there seems to be a microbial population in both cases, no matter which kind of bioactive okay. substrate you have in that substrate that uh, if you don't include some of that, and moving on to the next one, you're going to have kind of a, a cycling where it's going to get moldy or different things like that will happen. And if you include some of that older substrate, it'll help mitigate that some. Very interesting. I didn't even think about that microbial, my, I can't even talk, microbial aspect of, of the substrate. Yeah. Um, now, do they self-regulate their population or do you have to worry about, you know, just an explosion of isopods in the enclosure that you have to thin out? It depends on several factors, once again. Uh, on the species you're using, that, that can be an important aspect there because certain species will just, they're really, really prolific, especially at certain temperatures. Like the dwarf whites are really prolific if the substrate is moist and we have uh, you know, a fairly warm temperature. So if you're looking at say 80 degrees, 82 degrees, something like that, they will really, really breed like crazy. Of course, they're really small, so it may not be a problem for them to be a lot of them, as long as they're in balance with the kind of uh, nutrients that are going in there. And that's a big part of it too. I mean, what are they getting food-wise? If they're not getting a lot of food, they're not going to overpopulate the enclosure generally. If they're getting lots and lots of food, they're, they're going to reproduce a lot. So uh, you can regulate it to some degree that way uh, based on how much food is going in there. A lot of isopods, not all, but a lot of isopods breed much, much better if they're getting uh, leaf litter as a constant in their enclosure. And so if you have that, and then they're also getting supplemental food in, in the form of shed skins or um, leftover food from the, the macro inhabitant in your vivarium or whatever. Yeah. If they're getting enough of that, they might uh, really kind of overpopulate. But if you think, oh, well, all I have to do is reduce the leaf litter that I add in here, and then they're not going to reproduce as much. That does work for some species. And as far as like springtails are concerned, are there, are there 
different species of springtails that are used in the hobby or are they pretty much just all the same? Well, there, there are quite a few and some are much more tolerant of uh, humidity fluctuations. Some require really, really high humidity all the time, basically like dart frog level humidity or they don't do very well. And some can handle a lot more ventilation so you can use them in a semi-arid enclosure. Like I have springtails living in my uh, leopard gecko enclosure and they do great. Um, I feel like they're not as... Uh, you know, it's not quite as heavily populated by the springtails as some of my other enclosures because they have to stay right up against the substrate under the leaf litter most of the time because they, they just dry out if they were out in this well-ventilated warm enclosure. But uh, yeah, there, there are several species. The uh, species known as the giant springtail is one of the real useful ones. And uh, Sunella curvaceta is another one. I'm not sure it has a common name, but I use that one a lot and it's good in well-ventilated enclosures. And then I like to use Fulsomia candida, which is one that uh, likes really high humidity, but for high humidity enclosures, it's great. So those are, those two are my go-tos right there. I do have some other species that just kind of have shown up, smaller ones, but those two are big enough to do a good job and they're uh, readily available in the hobby. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. It's it's awesome, and and I hope that you know there's so many things I wanted to talk about that we didn't even have a chance to to discuss. <laughs> and I'm hoping that you'll be willing to come back on again in the future. Oh yes, um, I'd be delighted. That would be awesome. Yeah, there's still a lot more stuff I want to pick your brain about. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'm up for it anytime. Yeah, all right, man. Well, thanks again, and thanks to everybody that's listening or watching. You can. Uh, Check out uh, Aquarimax on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Definitely follow them, give them likes, uh, subscribe, all that good stuff. You can catch the Exotic Pet Collective. I'm uploading every Thursday on pretty much any platform that you can find your podcasts on. <laughs> We're on Google, Apple, all that. Thank you all for listening and watching. And uh, I guess we'll just talk next week. All right, y'all have a nice day. We'll see ya. <laughs> Right. All right. Awesome, man. That was very good. Well, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. It's always it was fun to talk to you last time, fun to talk to you this time. And it seems like really organic. Like it's easy to just we could keep talking, like you're saying. It would be super easy. <laughs>